the most valuable tool when it comes to any market, crypto, stocks. Or one day it's Thursday, July 18, 2024. And this is the week and charts. I appreciate want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. It's been kind of crazy lately. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, questions on trading your favorite stock and crypto picks. Hold off on those stock and crypto picks until we get to the live charts. And that'll be in a few minutes. It shouldn't take me too long to get through everything tonight. I want to kind of move it along tonight. Uh, I want to talk about the methodology in action, the downside of trend following, and also I have a smoke em report. And I'm going to continue my series on a million little things. Only only have a couple things I want to talk about tonight. I want to focus mostly on the market and the methodology. There's a display on the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And that's from Greg Morris. There's my, my uh, contact information if you need to screenshot that. I do answer my own emails eventually. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. So last week I talked about the TFM 10% system. And I'm just going to pull the slide up. So you can see the rules to the system. In fact, let me just go back a little bit. That's the buy rules. And this is where we were last week when I did the show. And then those are the sell rules. And the point I was making last week is if if the market went down and stopped this out, it's only gaining a couple of points a week, about two and a half points a week, uh, based on the slope of the moving average. So it's gonna take a while to catch up to anywhere reasonably close to price. Now, I thought it'd be interesting since we were having this little bit of a correction in the market to show you where we were at the peak. And this is based on the entry that was taken way back here. This, uh, With the system, it's a little slow to get you into the market. The designer's intent, as I've said a thousand times, was to design something to get you out of the market, to get you out of trouble, to avoid, as Ian McActifee used to call it, the diaper change moment, so to speak. And in doing so, I didn't focus too much on the re-entry, and that, that sort of came as an afterthought. The re-entry with this system works really well if you have a fairly extended bear market. It'll get you in fairly close to the bottom. However, if you have a spike type of signal, it's not going to follow it down with that spike. And that's sort of by designer's intent, too. I didn't want something that would have you chasing your own tail. This is a, a longer term trend following type of system, although it can kick in quickly like it did in the pandemic to get you out. But anyway, at the peak, it was I was up $18,000. Uh, like I said last week and many weeks prior, I just took 100 shares trades, kind of like on a, on a flyer, kind of a S&G type of trade. And I wasn't expecting such amazing, such an amazing run, almost 60%, which is just absolutely ludicrous. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. Anyway, when I did the screenshot earlier today, based on the low of the market where it was, that comes to about a $2,700 difference. Now, as I've said before, all trades eventually end badly, and that's especially when it when it when it comes to trend following. Now, I suppose you're doing some sort of option capturing, uh, naked selling or whatever. Some of those don't end badly, but eventually they will. But what I mean by in badly is that you have a bit of a drawdown at the end. It comes with the territory. Now, longer term trend following, you need a really, really wide stop and your accuracy is going to be abysmal. Your drawdowns are going to be horrible. And the way I've kind of compensated for these, these nuances, which are unavoidable. And remember, as I've preached, the only way to ever make money in a market is to capture a trend. So trend following is really the only way to make money. Even if you're a contra trend player, a new trend must come along. But the way I mitigate for this is I take partial profits. Now, this system is just a, I don't have any money management built into this. So I, I just figured, well, let's just throw 100 shares in and see what happens. But, you know, once you're up $18,000 or whatever, that, that, that it's starting to become real money is what I'm saying. So maybe I need a little money management for the system. All right, we have a smoke report, uh, actually two of them. And then I got all excited thinking that we were finally getting into a nice, or continuing, I should say, the nice trend we've been in with, uh, with the setups, knock on wood. Come in. <laughs> I need a new joke. 
Uh, anyway, so UL, this was an IPO, uh, first deep retracement. It's it's one of my, it's probably my second favorite IPO pattern. My first one would be buy at D, and that's where you're looking to buy on the, the highest close after at on day five or beyond. I'm not going to get into that tonight because we talked about it so many times. You could search my website or search uh, YouTube for that, for the buy at B. Anyway, you can see the parameters down here, and I have it listed as a first deep retracement. Entry of 40, stop at 35, IPT of 45.25, and that's a risk of $5. So in a 100K account, you would risk 400 shares, you would buy 400 shares based on that. And that seems like a fairly wide stop, not but not nearly as crazy as this one. And we're gonna look at those stop percentages in just one second as part of one of the million little things. Anyway, entry was there, stop was way down there, and the IPT was there. So far, so good, knock on wood, we banged out that, that IPT. Remember, when we hit the IPT, we're taking off half of our profits. And as I was thinking about these slides, when I woke up this morning, the reason we take off half is just in case that's all we get, it's kind of like what happened on AMSC. And, and ironically, I'm going to use AMSC as an example of pulling risk off, which I'll show you right now. And that's one of the important things of taking those partial profits. So before we do all that, this was set up as a trend pivot pullback. The little bar here, let's just go back a little bit. A trend pivot pullback is when you have like a false rally or an actual false rally within a pullback and you look to get in above that little false rally and that's a that's a pretty good pretty good trade to take a pretty good setup to take I should say so here's the parameters and by the way you can download these davelander.com slash archives and, and this is literally where I got this one from went back to the archives and you can see uh, four to 35 shares round up or down depending on how you want to look at that, but 400, 400 shares round numbers. And these are just calculations based on the spreadsheet, based on where the stop is placed. Entry 2560, stop of 21, and an IPT of 3020. So let's take a look at that. So entry was there, stop is here, IPT was there, and then we trailed the stop higher on the remainder. So that this one actually stopped out a little while ago, and I'll show you the, the final trade. So what's interesting is if you take a look at this and you look at how much of your account, this is something I don't talk about a lot, but I'd like to point this out. And uh, Brian, I'll, I'll, we'll get to your question. Just one second. Keep them coming, though. But you can see if you were to buy four to 35 shares, and obviously you round that one way or the other, at 2560, that's 11,136, and that's based on again 100k account. So we're looking at 11% of your account is in this one stock, which is not totally crazy, but it's 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 enough to be concerned about. Now, here's the crazy thing: is is as your stops get wider, as I've explained before, with the volatile stocks, your share size comes down, and sometimes your risk is actually much 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 less i did a, a article many years ago i wrote an article many years ago on random thoughts on better the devil you know and you're much better off trading a more volatile stock within reason than you are a less volatile stock so this buy right here at this level here would cost you <clears throat> excuse me cost you eleven thousand dollars and change of margin now when you hit the IP, or, or let's just back up a second. One cent before the IPT, the IPT is 3020. As you can see up here, IPT is initial profit target. Those new to the system. So once you hit that, then you take off half of your shares. But the the moment right before that hits, let's just say three not three thirty nineteen. You now have thirteen thousand one thirty three. Now I know your account grew a little bit based on this, but to keep the math easy, we always say we have a hypothetical one hundred k in the account. 
So based on that, about 13% of your account. So you can see as a stock moves in your favor, it becomes more and more of your account, especially if you have other losses. Think about that because your equities, your total equity is going down and your total equity in this one stock is going up. So, so those percentages could get fairly high fairly quickly. It's a good problem to have, but it, it can happen. So I thought it would be interesting to look at it one cent before the profit target. So now you've got 13%. And I know those numbers are hard to, it's hard to figure in because yeah, the, the account went up a little bit, but you could have other problems with the account of other losses or whatever, as I just said. But anyway, now once you hit the IPT, you would take off half of those shares, okay? Now, in taking off half of those shares, you're now the stock is now 6.9% of your account, and this should be this should be 6,500 right here, I think. I forgot to put that in, but anyway, move this number to here, and that's 6.9% of your account value. Now, notice it's not half of this, and that's because the price went up on the stock. Now. This one just opt out, but what I was going to say earlier is should this one keep on keeping on, let's say it went to 60, which doesn't happen often, but it could, right? Then then all of a sudden your numbers are much, much bigger, and now you're you're up to a, a much bigger percentage of your account that's in the one stock. Now, we don't plan on losing 100% of a stock price, okay? But sooner or later, a stock will get whacked. We've had a few halves that happened to us before. And it sure is nice when it happens when you're deep into the money from where you entered the position. So up here at the top, and this is the point I was talking about earlier, as it will begin to creep up as the stock goes up, even after you take those partial profits off. So at the peak here, it was at, it was, uh, and again, I didn't do my math right. My apologies. So it should be this should be 7,128 right here. So it's 7% of your account. So half would be like five and a half round numbers from where you started, but now you're creeping up to 7% and change, okay? So that's 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 part of an, an angle to the money management that I never did discuss, and that's margin. And usually the margin is not a huge issue because again, we're trading more volatile stocks as a general statement. And I'm gonna get back to volatility here in just one second. So Brian's asking, do I ever trade with collars? Can you can you give me an example? Like uh, you're saying, if this is hit, then this is gonna be hit or whatever. Maybe I do that with um, like one cancels the other OCO. I haven't placed actual orders. I've had clients before that have um, noodled with that type of thing. But if the IPT is hit, you're bringing your stock to break even. So maybe you could have a, a, a stop loss order and then you could have an IPT order. But um, I would use, you would be using half on both. So I don't really see the need to, to, to use a collar, if that's what you mean by collar. But uh, let me know, give me an example of what you would say. Uh, you'd be like dual orders and we could flesh that out a little bit. All right, I mentioned a couple of things last week. One in particular I want to follow up on. And I talked about pickup sticks. And what I was referring to is linear regression. And you're probably thinking, like, Dave, you don't really get into all that crazy stuff. It's like, I know, but I've played with everything over the years. And the point I was making with the pickup sticks, and this is a, a, a child game. In fact, one time I mentioned them in a webinar, and I was telling my wife about them. And, and to reminisce our childhood, we both were thinking about pickup sticks, or whatever talking about it that we both played as kids. So I actually bought some. This is actually a picture of the of the ad that I bought them from. Anyway, uh, they, it's just a little game. You just throw them on the ground and you, you got to pick them up without moving the other ones around and all. The point I was making is persistency is the most valuable tool when it comes to any market, crypto, stocks, anything. Persistency is a market's ability to go up day after day after day after day after day. Now, I like to draw a bar, a line, I should say, through as many bars as possible, seeing how many I can intersect. Now, mathematically, like I said last week, that's the equivalent of linear regression. 
and I would recommend you play around with linear regression a little bit, plot it on your charts like this, and just kind of looking at this on the fly here, it's like, well, what do we have? We've got a pretty nice persistent uptrend in the S&P 500, and so far, this is just a, just a bit of a knockout bar. Now, by accident, I plotted these pickup sticks on a 30-minute chart, and it looks a little bit like that. So uh, it's kind of interesting that they're all headed straight down going back in time. And and again, play with this. And I don't know if it works with new TC as well as it did with the old one. The old one, what would happen is you could actually go back in time and these things would 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 intertwine and go back and forth. And it was kind of a neat little exercise. Now, again, don't rush out and throw a bunch of lines in your chart or whatever. But this indicator, or as I like to call them, illustrator, because nothing indicates anything. If, if you had an indicator that actually indicated, you would own the world, okay? And believe me, I've tried. <laughs> if I ever find one, you never find my, you ever see my fat ass again. But the, all kidding aside, the using them as illustrators can be really cool. Like the Landry light, which we can take a look at in a few minutes, can be really helpful. And it helps to alert you to what's going on in charts. Yeah, this chart's going down, obviously with the indicators or illustrators, as I just called them in it, you could see that it was going down, right? Uh, this one's going up and you might be looking at the trees for the forest and not see the fact that this is still in a really solid uptrend. So that's what I was talking about last week. I, I, I said we'd look at it in the, in the big charts. So we can look at it in the, in the, when we get to the live charts too, not the big charts, the live charts. Let me slow down here a second. <laughs> but anyway, so that's what that looks like. And that's just various linear regressions. You can kind of count the bars and figure it out like this cyan. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so that's 10. So I've probably got like 5, 10, 15, 20. And then when I get to the bigger numbers, I jump up. Okay. So Brian says, yes, it's my favorite strategy. You buy a protective put and sell a call to finance the put. Okay. Let me stop you right there. If if you're good at doing that, don't let me muck you up, okay? But I I prefer to keep it simple. Now I do a little I did a little spread today, truth be told, and I did some I did some ratio spreads on the S&P 500. Overall, I lost money, so I'm not bragging. But what I did is, as the market's falling, I would sell calls, and I would buy calls on the outside two times, okay? So if the market kept dropping, essentially I got free calls all the way down. If the market began to rally, then I, my calls would cover the um, short calls. So if you're selling a call to finance a put, then you're, you have unlimited upside, and then you buy a put, okay? And so you have the maximum on the downside. Well, somewhat, un, somewhat unlimited, but it's a put, so technically 100%, right? 100% in the underlying well it gets complicated pretty fast because if that market begins to rally now you're losing money on the short call do you cover your put to recoup some of that money or do you just let it rot as the option people like to say when they're well there in that case you wouldn't be short that one but usually we let a um when i say we back in the day when i work for a hedge fund that traded options we would we would call it let it get rot when we had short positions we would let them just decay okay decay is just a uh the time coming off the options caller would be buying back puts and selling calls for stock protections sale of calls pays for some of all the protective puts limit your downside but buying puts and selling calls okay so just the opposite buying puts and selling calls Sale of calls pays for some of the protective puts. Now, do you own the underlying two? See, the problem with options is you, you, you end up with a lot of moving parts really quick. And one thing that's kind of shocking to me is a lot of times they'll they'll let one of the first things they'll let people do in the options world when you fill out your paperwork or whatever, they'll, they'll let you sell covered calls. Well, you know how complicated that is? You've got a stock 
and then you're selling a call against that stock and let's say the stock drops well you get you get your money off the call that's nice cover the call that, that that worked out pretty good but now you have a loss in the stock so do you sell another call i, I guess and it just gets complicated really really fast and it will a lot of a lot of moving parts okay so you own the underlying well your cap your capture you, with your short call you're limited your upside gains if you're if you're selling the call now i like to to get in with the potential for unlimited gains I, I just hate to do anything to to get rid of to just unload stock now i did have a client a few weeks back and he's not familiar with options but i was going to suggest that he didn't want to give up his stock right away i su suggested to possibly do some do some covered calls but that would be getting rid of your stock as it got called away so um covered calls was slightly slightly bearish i forget exactly what it is i think you're you're slightly bearish on the stock and that's the best time to sell a cover call um you must hold the underlying stocks 100 share minimum i prefer so jeff likes ratio spreads options only now with your ratio spreads jeff are you buying the inside or you're selling the inside i target the short call to match the uh, appropriate percent of stock yeah i used we would have to sit down i'd have to sit down with you because i i know people watching this their eyes are glazing over because i'm i'm getting a little lost too okay if the collar if the collar starts to become out of the money then i sell the collar as a package yeah it's it's uh that that's work so the, the quick the answer getting back to the answer of the question is no i don't use collars like that um when it comes to options but the thing is with options as i've said a hundred times if you really know what you're doing and i start telling you about options then you you'll probably disagree with me and if you don't know what you're doing then i'll probably confuse you so it, it's kind of a it's kind of a can of worms as i've said before buy two in the money call sell one at the money call to finance part of the purchase two in the money call sell one at the money call okay so you're you're selling at the money and you're buying in the money okay that's going to take me a while to wrap my head around the only the only ratio spreading that i've done is selling at the money and buying out of the money and that and i really haven't made it work that well but to me there's something about if a market really takes off you're getting you're getting those free options as opposed to uh having to pay for them but then again, if the market really took off, you'd been better off just buying the options just above at the money. Yeah, Jeff, I'd like to um, maybe we could have if you guys want, we could maybe sit around. I, I know you want to party with us, huh? but we could sit around and have an options talk one day. We do a webinar and I could open up a, so you could have a two way chat and we could uh, we could all talk about this stuff. If it's something you're interested in, um, I could possibly shoot some holes in it, but you're probably you probably know way more than I do if you're doing all these collars and, and complex things. And I, I, my take on option options is if you're an engineer, I think Larry McMillan is an engineer type. He's one of the most smartest persons intelligence wise, like, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I, that's kind of the same thing, but just, just his intelligence is just a, a, amazing. And he's also down to earth. He'll, you know, He'll drink a beer with you you know he's just a great guy uh, i love him uh but it, it it's it helps if you're really smart if you like to it seems like people like the engineers types who like to noodle with things and kind of tinker because you can you're selling the calls and buying the puts and doing all this other stuff and then you're figuring out a way to make it work whereas to me i just like to stick to the trend following more on stuff and then every now and then maybe step on the gas and get some long options oh okay great example okay well, i'll keep these uh you know what i'll screenshot these or i'll get to the chat when we're done and i'll i'll uh i'll get up to speed on this before we get together and, and talk about it all right shifted gears uh, lately i've been doing a series on a million little things in no particular order i just want to go through a couple of these things tonight i want to jump into the markets and take a look at whatever you want to look at too when it comes to the markets but yeah, I'm fascinated with all this option stuff. So so keep it coming. We'll uh 
I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, I've been part of things that have ended really badly with options. So I'm a little, what's the word, gun shy, I guess, when it comes to options. But I do, I do occasionally like to, to do a little, mostly own options. And I know the options people think that's, um, that's a sin, but to me, it just seems like the unlimited risk is, is more of a sin. <laughs> All right, so Brian's an engineer. There you go. There you have it. <laughs> it's great for people who like to tinker with things. It's great for engineers, you know, and you can figure out all the angles. And yeah, that's fantastic. All right, number 78,953, accept the market's risk, not your own. The market doesn't care about what you want to risk, okay? So a while back, somebody was asking me about stop percentages, and I added this, I just threw this column in the spreadsheet to show them, and they asked me if I would leave it in the spreadsheet. So this basically takes the, or exactly, I should say, it takes the amount of risk and figures out how far that stop is away from the price. Now you could see something like KNF, which had a, a what was it, IPO at the time we first got in it, but as it traded for a while, you could see that it wasn't super volatile, even though it kind of looked like it was volatile. The HV was fairly low and something like the NNE, which actually went up 250% on one day while we were in it, okay? And uh, I'm kicking myself because it didn't peel off shares where I should have, but that's another story altogether, especially in light of a few things I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> Uh, laugh to keep from crying. But uh, as I said a few weeks ago, we talked about that. That usually, if there's options on something, I'll do a little bit of uh, there's those options again. I'll buy some crazy out of the money options for SGs and I'll take profits on a par portion of the position because I know that position is going to retrace back down, especially if it's up 250% in one day. But anyway, I wanted to show you this column. You can see that this is a less volatile stock, so it's only 15% risk. The NNE is more volatile, and then the AMSC is somewhere in between those two. Now, throughout my career when I was um, as a since I've done the trading service, and I don't know how many years it's been, 20 years, I guess, maybe more. Several times people have told me like, for instance, like a 30% stop, I think it was like um, ARLP was one of my bigger winners a while back, had a 30% stop. The NNE obviously just had a 30 something percent stop. And you, you have to trade what the market calls for, and then adjust your share size down forget about those positions i forget about those percentages so 30 something percent stop uh, i can't use no 30 something percent stop uh, then you ain't getting no gold uh, like a caddyshack is it just me or have you gone back and watched some of these movies that you just thought were the funniest ever <laughs> they're not that funny anymore at least <laughs> space balls space balls has its moments but last time i, I rewatched it i was a little disappointed my neighbor let his son watch it, and uh, <laughs> now he runs around saying, I'm surrounded by assholes, but um, that's another story altogether. That was Kevin Bacon in uh, Animal House? Yes, I get the ending badly, too. Thank you, sir. I may have another Kevin Bacon. Oh, I didn't realize he was in Animal House. That's, that makes the Kevin Bacon game a lot easier. So you have to, again, adjust to the market's volatility. I would love to go in and trade E-minis and use one point, okay? What's an E-mini? $50 a point, you know, or maybe two points. Okay, I'm going to go and use two points. Well, by the time I get my order in, I'm already down two points. You know, so it's it's just going to, you're guaranteeing yourself. If you're within that, let's say this is the normal noise of the market. That might be 30%, right? And this stock, this stock, you try to get in there. It's going to stop you out. You're you're nearly guaranteed. Now I don't use statistics a lot in trading, but statistically that's one thing that I can guarantee. If you're using a one point stop on a stock that trades bounces around three or four points a day, you're going to get stopped out. Okay, 
number 55,251. Like I said, whenever I do something, a lot of times it's as much for me as it is for you. I'm like, oh, you know what? I need to tell my peeps how I'm effing up or when I'm doing okay, like we did on those positions, right? Because we all can learn from each other. And long story endless, as I know I've told it a hundred times. So uh, John, Brian, Jeff, you guys want to go get a, a beer? You know, I'll, I'll be done in a couple of minutes. But long story endless, uh, I remember, and I try not to trade. I don't want to make it sound like I trade e-minis a lot, but every now and then I'll squeeze off a few. And I remember when I was trying to get into it a few years back, I came in one day and and I'd lost like three days in a row or whatever. And I'm, you know, like like a definition of insanity. I want to, or beating your head against the wall. It feels so good when you stop, you know? So, and I came in the next day and it's like, I didn't get any trades. I'm like, well, that's, I didn't get any trades all day long. And then the next day I didn't get any trades. I'm like, well, that's two days in a row. The third day, I made money and I it, I forget exactly how it went, but I know that I was like, what the hell is happening? I'm not getting any trades and the trades that I'm getting for the most part seem to be working. And then I realized by accident, I changed my intraday charts to 30 minutes. And from that point forward, I changed all my charts to 30 minutes. I was looking at a five minute chart or something like that. And the other day, and I don't remember exactly what day it was, and I can go and find it, but it, that's inconsequential. The, the other day, a week and a half ago, I had, by accident, I had a five-minute chart up on the Sox L. And this thing starts taking off, and I'm like, I just jumped in it. I felt like I, I had extreme FOMO. And then it just implodes. I'm like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, why did I chase my tail? I better get out. And all of a sudden, it goes straight back up. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And then I lay, it's like, oh, you dumbass. It, you know, your charts were changed back to five minutes for some reason. But anyway, I just did a screen capture going back a week or so ago. And you could see the Sox sell. I really didn't do a whole lot in those periods. It kind of went down a little, went up a little. You know, maybe there would have been a trade or two in this. But for the most part, especially in hindsight, there's not a whole lot of trades. But then take a look at the five-minute chart, okay? So it's it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's Jackie Mason. And if you're looking at that, you're thinking this thing is going to the moon, Alice implied, right? Anyway, you can see that it's much, you get into much less trouble on a different time frame. Now, if 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 the five minutes your time frame, knock yourself out. I'm not criticizing anybody for the way they trade. There's more than one way to skin a cat, but just make sure you're within your time frame. It kind of reminds me of sort of. Side note, it reminds me of what Linda Rasky said. There's a what are these, she talks about all these different ways that people will do things that are that are bad behaviors, and one of them is keep changing your time frame till you get the chart you want. <laughs> Kevin Bacon in Animal House. All right, so this is what I thought I thought about too. Is like what's eating you? Gilbert Great implied. I thought I thought Gilbert Great was Leonardo DiCaprio, the special needs kid, but it turns out it's Johnny Depp. And I've never seen the movie. I, I remember seeing enough of the movie to know that I don't want to see the movie. It's this morbidly obese woman, and it's this dysfunctional family. And, uh, you know, hit pause if you want to go watch it. But I, I seem to remember they were, like, knocking down the side of the house because the woman was so fat. They had to get her out with a crane. She died. The dad had died. It just was a – it looked like a train wreck. <laughs> Anyway, but uh, you need to figure out what's eating your Gilbert Grape. And as I've said before, you know, unexpected expense. And, and like right now, I'm guilty. We had a, a couple of trees. Some tree guys were close by. And we had uh, one was struck by lightning. The other was kind of dead. And we've got, we're in the middle of storm season here, hurricane season. So while the tree guys were out, I was like, hey, you guys, could you take down a couple of trees? So it's all of a sudden, it's like cha-ching, cha-ching, a couple thousand dollars there. Um, my wife has a German car, check engine lights on after spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on it. So now it's kind of like, it's pretty much bricked at this point, the way I see it, the way we see it. So, and, and you know, my, my, I have a beater I use, I drive a mile and a half a day. It needs about $3,000 worth of work, new tires, new suspension, all kinds of stuff. So it's like, all this is in the back of my head, thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's like, 
damn, you know, it's like, and I'm, and I'm coming to market and, and that baggage comes with me. And as I often say, you got to identify all the extraneous and that's where your morning pages comes in and your documentation. Now, even an expected expense, no one, because you still have to come up with money, right? But as I said a while back, I was talking with someone and they were having a really bad week. Now, they, they're a little bit more active than me or they do a lot more active trading in addition to what they normally do too. And uh, he said, he said, man, I was trading like hell all weekend. I couldn't, well, all week and I couldn't figure it out. Finally, the weekend comes, you know, he's having a beer and all of a sudden it dawned on him on Monday, he had to make a $40,000 payment for his son's tuition. And the whole week he was, he was just thinking about that $40,000 and sometimes it could, it could really mess with your head. So you got to figure out what's, what's messing with you. And, and we've talked about this before. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I know you're in part of, I know you're in part of it, but anyway, <laughs> the extraneous things, you know, a fight with your spouse, your significant other or both, right. Can really mess things up. And it, it, it is like health. It can be major or minor. I had a cold a few weeks back. I know that affected my performance a little bit. My wife, I forget when this was, but she had she had twisted an ankle really bad or broken a foot or something. And it, it wasn't me that was injured, but she was injured and she likes to move around and do things and go for walks and go work out or whatever. And it was stopping her from doing those things. So it's kind of like if mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And hopefully she can't, she's not in her in the bathroom so she could hear me here. I've got a separate office, separate from the house, but we share a common wall. Anyway, so you'll have to answer those questions. The best way to answer those questions is to do your morning pages. And it's just, I used to call it a brain dump. And then years later, 20 something years later, I read with Junior, Camp, Junior Cameron, which I loaned the book out. I have no idea where it is. I only read the first chapter of it, which she talked about the morning pages. It was a little quirky the way she talked about it, but if it works for you the way she talks about it, like creating characters and all, that's fine. But I, I was like, aha, I remember that. And I found some old morning pages from like 20 something years ago. And I remember thinking, damn, can you imagine if I'd have kept that up for 30 years or however long it was, what a valuable resource that would be. All right, let's uh, jump to crypto. <laughs> Keep changing time frames until it gets the chart you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a good book. That's Trading Sardines. I don't have it within reach. I helped uh, Linda edit the book. I, I really enjoyed it. All right, we're going to go to, we'll hop over to crypto real quick and we'll get some other charts loaded in the meantime. Uh, if there's any crypto pairs you guys want to talk about, feel free to start punching them in. So Bitcoin's kind of all, kind of, uh, sort of all over the place. We had a lot of downside Landry light, meaning that the highs or less than the moving average of the 30 EMA. And another one of those you want to part over me things is the 30 EMA is my favorite, at least right now, moving average. So we do have a couple of bars of Landry Light above, about three bars or so. The problem I'm seeing with Bitcoin is, and believe me, I want to be a bull, okay? So I, I think the, uh, the Bitcoin bulls are they're crazy. <laughs> I guess I'm one of them too, but I'm also a technician first, as, as much as I, I want it to go up. But we do have some overhead supply back here to deal with. So that's the, the thing that concerns me. For me to get excited about Bitcoin, it would have to get up into the 70,000s, 70 like brand new highs, all-time highs. I like to see all-time highs before getting too excited. Now the shit coins, S-H-Y-T, let's take a look at Ethereum first. Ethereum is just kind of all over the place. It, it got out, it took off a while back. And I believe you guys were saying that's probably when they introduced the ETFs and people got excited about it. People that would never figure, try to go through the trouble of figuring out how to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum, the would buy an ETF. And that supposedly was gonna create some demand, but it really hasn't. Um, my, my concern, just uh, not to go off on a tangent, imagine that, my concern, it's kind of like gold, all right? And I say this each week, but there's enough. If you had an Olympic swimming pool, I believe, it, all the gold in the world would fit in it, okay? If you had a decent backyard, all the gold in the world would fit in your backyard. But 
there's a lot more gold than that that's being traded, okay? And Bitcoin is becoming something just like that. So you've got uh, you got the ETFs now. Do they really own the Bitcoin? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe so. All these exchanges. I know a lot of exchanges got caught with their pants down, didn't really have the Bitcoin, right? So I think that the market's maturing. There's only 21 million, okay? That means, as I've written before, that means only everybody in Florida could have one or every other person in California could have one, okay? And you see all this demand all around the world. It just doesn't add up, right? But not to confuse the issue with facts, just look at the charts. Now, this pirate is taken off. I don't know what this uh, what this one is, but you can see it's taken off. And it, it, as I often say, when the the shit coins, SHYT coins, really get to moving, sometimes you can just come in here with RS and buy the strongest ones. And I haven't done much trading in the shit coins in a while. And and you know, here's another one of those uh, million things. It's like I I've, I haven't been really focusing on them lately because they're all headed down or have been headed down you can see the slope on these moving averages and these are the stronger pairs i'm looking at at the moment but you can see most of these have halved or more the whole while you've had you've had landry light below the moving average all right any pairs you guys want me to look at in the um in crypto all right let me jump into the let me jump into stocks and let me check on my YouTube brethren too while we're at it. All right, let me shift gears. We'll go to we'll go to stocks. If you guys want me to look at, I'm just gonna briefly go through what's what's happening in stocks. And then if you guys want to look at any individual stocks, your favorite stocks or something you're considering, let me know. I'll be happy to take a look at it. All right, let's take a look at the P's. Got a lot of editing tomorrow. <laughs> That's a P five hundred, like I said earlier. So far it just looks like a trend knockout, okay? And if you wanted market exposure, and let's say you're you haven't had you don't have anything in the market. By the way, I, I wish I'd have written down what day it was. And uh, I don't know if I said it in last week's week of charts or not, but uh, this gentleman came up to me in the gym, and I usually kind of keep quiet about what I do and stuff um, locally. But uh, some kid had saw that I have a, a tattoo of uptrend, downtrend, and sideways on my arm. <laughs> and he was trying to get into E-minis through a prop firm. And he's like, I like your tattoo. I'm like, all right, thank you. And we got to talk to markets. And then, you know, like EF hunting people start leaning in. And, and everybody found out that I, I do a little trade. Anyway, this uh, this little nice little man, uh, super nice guy, was bragging to me that he takes a certain amount out of his account every month and then when he gets his monthly statement in his account value is the same value or higher he, he goes it never goes down and i'm like oh shit. <laughs> that is the fat lady singing right there you know and I, I i do think there's some merit to listening to the man on the street when it comes to markets and i should have i wish i'd have put a big arrow on the chart so i'd know when uh, i didn't want to believe it i guess you know but anyway, if you were looking to get exposure to the overall market, S&P 500, nice little knockout move today. You could put an entry above the high and stop below the low, and you're uh, you're off and running on that. Getting back to cash, you can see still looks pretty darn good. So far, so good. And as I've been saying for a while, the market could use a correction. And they're blaming it on stupid stuff from what I – I try not to look at any news, but I saw that they're blaming on stupid things, you know, like uh, – they blame it on the fact that Biden may pull out of the race. And it's like, well, I thought everybody knew that, you know, so I can't figure it out. It, it, nor nor should I try or nor should you try. Now, as a composite kind of looks like a nice little pullback. I, I know it's got a gap in here, but it still looks pretty good. So far, so good. Just pulling back a little bit. The rusty, this thing was abysmal forever. And then... Somebody slapped it in the ass. And look at that, it just went straight up. Now, my concern is that it's, it has all this overhead supply back here. And what happens, as you likely know, is that anybody who bought in here is looking to get out at break even. And markets have very long memories. Now, I know it's two years ago, but there's probably some people still holding on to the rusty from way back when, back in the day. But so far, so good. It's had a really nice breakout. Now, it got whacked pretty hard today. 
but so far so good on a breakout. Again, I wouldn't rush out and buy because of his overhead supply, but it is good to see this waking up. And there's been a, a really vicious sort of sector rotation as of late. And I was pretty excited because for a while, the old leaders were still hanging in there and all these new leaders emerged. It was just the opposite for a while. The old leaders were doing really well. And then all these other areas were doing poorly. And that's where everybody in the brother was, was preaching about the breath being so bad in the market because you only had these few leaders. Well, my point was that the glass is kind of half full as long as the indices are at or near new highs, all time highs, right? For the most part, then just kind of see this glass half full. And when those sectors kick into gear, the market's really going to blow off. Unfortunately, those sectors kicked in. And for a little while, the old sectors were hanging in there, but then they got whacked too, the semiconductors and such, which we'll take a look at. Anyway, gold, the commodity, getting whacked a little bit. Other are the base metals you can see here, DBB, they're beginning to break down. I don't know if that's a, a sign of inflation coming off or what. I don't want to think too much. Intermarket technical analysis only works when it works. Do read Murphy's book on intermarket technical analysis, but don't try to, to, to use it every day, all day. There's long lead and lag cycles, which basically is a, cat, is a way of saying that it doesn't always work. But when it works, it can work. And the other thing too, just real quick, back in the day, if you could figure out the P's, you could trade bonds. If you figure out bonds, you could trade P's. Doesn't work that easily anymore. They were, they were correlated, anti-correlated, however you want to look at it. Anyway, uh, GDX is the gold stocks. They're pulling back a little bit. So far, so good. You don't want to see a pullback all the way to that prior breakout. But so far, so good there. Gold, the commodity, pulling back a little bit. Again, you don't want to see it pull back below its breakout levels, which it's almost pulled back to already. Software got whacked. Software made it all the way back to its old highs, and it got whacked. As I preach quite often and said tonight, tonight's service, sometimes you have a market like this that's way down here. By the time it gets all the way back to its old highs, it's already overbought. So it's hard for it to keep that trend happening. And of course, if you know a little bit about technical analysis, that ends up turning into what? A double top, right? People that got in over here are getting out of break even. So I'm not a big fan of how software is looking right now. And that's been one of the lagger areas for a while. Now, take a look at the banks. The banks probed all-time highs. I think it was all-time highs on the KBE. Nope, not quite, but getting there, okay? Nearly all-time highs before they came back in. Insurance is doing really well. If you take a look, today notwithstanding, though, all those areas got hit too. But take a look at the financials. They've recently broken out to all-time highs here. Yeah, all-time highs here. We got an outside day today, not the end of the world. So far, the breakout remains intact there. So the point is with the sector action is we're having this crazy rotation. Now drugs were making at, making new highs just yesterday, all time highs, but then today they got waxed, so they're getting a little wide and loose at these high levels. So watch for that. Take a look at like the mags though. The mags look pretty good. If you were looking again to gain some market exposure, this would be a good way to get it. If if these old leaders, these magnificent seven begin to start taking off again. Retail got whacked today. So far though, it's breakout remains intact. Just looks a little knockout in nature, at least based on that index. And if you take a look at some of these other ones, the home builders have just absolutely melted up. And I didn't think that this would be sustainable and it did kind of peter out a little bit. You can see it shot to all time highs before coming back in. It's had kind of a melt up, and that's that same situation too. And the market rallies from low levels to all time highs that quickly. It's a little too far, a little too, uh, a little too quickly. Let's take a look at a couple more areas, and then uh, if there's no stocks, we'll wrap it up. But it, let me know if you have any stocks you want me to take a look at. I'd be happy to do that. Take a look at the energies. Energies have been in kind of a downtrend. They rallied up a little bit, sold off again, and now they're beginning to bounce. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet, but they they have been improving as of late. But let's just take a look at the semis because semis is one of my favorite areas to watch. And I'm of the belief as goes semis, so does the market. And unfortunately, the semis got whacked. I don't think it's the end of the world just yet. What we were talking about earlier, 
let's just tame let's just change time frames till we get the chart we want there you go <laughs> on a weekly chart just a trend knockout almost a double top knockout okay but back to the daily we do need to pay attention here we it's this nasty gap here and i hate to use the word hope but i'm hoping we go back to new highs i wouldn't i wouldn't sell the form just yet and call it call semis out forever but that is a little bit of a concern let's take a look at nvidia yeah, NVIDIA kind of looks like the SMH overall. You can see we've got a gap down here. So it's beginning to look questionable. I certainly wouldn't buy NVIDIA at this juncture. I think I think I kicked NVIDIA out a couple days ago out of the Landry 100 or or maybe yesterday on the gap down or whatever. Anyway, all right. Any individual stocks? Has there ever been a time uh, in history where the IWM has gone up without the QQQ following it to i could do a search but i'll wait until after the webinar what i would encourage you to do and i don't want to do it on a fly just because everything's gonna it could mess up but i would i would go to stock charts and i don't know if you could do it on a free account or not but put in iwm colon qqq and that's going to give you a ratio chart and i think that'd be kind of an interesting thing to look at when the nasdaq is outperforming the um russell and, and vice versa and years ago i've tried a little bit of everything but years ago i would take i would take one chart and i forget how i did it maybe i'd screenshot one or whatever with a transparent background and kind of slide them over each other and that was kind of a and, and i know you want to party with me kind of a fun exercise but you could also plot two in the same chart so uh, i never really thought about it um let me just see if i could do something here on the fly i've got the cues and is there a way to put a comparison symbol in here now? I was getting ready to say the new TC. I guess it's been a new TC for 10 years. Let's see if we can add plots. Um, anybody know how to add a plot? We could do it in, um, yeah, it's gonna be hard to do on a fly, but we could certainly, uh, I, could, I could load up a few charts with all these things for next week. But yeah, that's a, that's a good exercise to do, by the way, is, is studying one index against the other and see how it works or one market against the other in a market technical analysis all that good stuff all right any it's easy to do on trading view okay so andrea says it's easy to do on trading view two stocks nn and grm i like nn to some extent okay, nn okay we're long nn right now that's why i like it i was thinking nne uh right now i don't I wouldn't rush out and buy it. I had high hopes for this one. I really thought we were going to bang out that IPT. And, you know, maybe it's not over just yet, but it's had a pretty good run as of late. And I'm not too nervous just yet, but of course I'll stop out of a stop out. But I would wait for this one to bang out new highs and play pullbacks before um, doing that. Okay, on YouTube, let's see. Okay, open QQQ and trading view, and then click the plus sign to compare with IWM. Okay, we'll try that. We'll try that next week. But thank you so much because I'll, I'll I'll get I'll get some charts set up, and we'll we'll do that. Okay. Um, what was the other stock? It was NN and let me just go over here for a second. GRMD. Okay. So yeah, hold off on NN for now. GRMD. Uh, the GRMD is not coming up on my screen. GRMD, okay. GRMD, uh, GRM, C, GRMD. Nope. Do you have a different? Um, do you have a different symbol for that one? Yeah. Thanks again on the trading view tip. I'll uh, I'll check that out. Okay, any more any more stocks? HMY. HMY is gonna be a gold stock for Keith. Um, I think you could probably do better in gold than this one, but I don't have any that come to the top off the top of my head. Let me let's uh I meant to look at silver earlier. SLV. Yeah, silver's kind of wide and loose now. We were long SVM. If you rewind the tape, you could see after it's published that we had SVM as one of our stocks. We got stopped out of it though. But HMY, HMY is is uh, put it on your momentum list. But Keith, it broke out, okay, and then it's come back to where it's broken out from. So that's I'm not a big fan of markets that do that. Now I know gold stocks can be a little choppy. 
Okay, I'm with you on Simi Space. I always follow Intel and AMD. Can you look at them? Oh, I'll be happy to, Brian. Intel's been kind of lackluster throughout this whole um, process. I did bottom out recently. Uh, I'm not too excited about it. I know one of you guys were talking about bottom fishing here. And it looks like it would have worked, but it's just not my forte to fight the big blue arrow. Um, nothing to get too excited about with Intel for now, at least. Uh, we did get stopped out at AMSC today, you can see here. It's a nice little TKO type of move. It's actually a pretty good looking chart. The only caveat is it did kind of pull back to the prior pullback. See the prior pullback here, okay? And it broke out from there. I, I don't like them when they pull back to the prior pullback, but for the most part, it's an okay looking setup. TKO would be entry above the high, stop out somewhere down here. Okay, what was the other one AMD? Yeah, AMD is just kind of wide and loose. You know, if you if you want to go up to something in semiconductor space, try to find something that looks more like AMSC than AMD, which is sideways at best, and it's now about down to its old lows. Okay. Is that forming a cup? Which one? The NN? Yeah, sort of. I'm not a huge fan. Or, or not as big a fan as I used to be of cup and handles at high levels. I do like them at low levels. Uh, what's uh, there's one that's kind of well, this one's okay. Um, this is stock's a little wide and loose, but I like them when they're at like all time lows and form that cup and handle. I'm trying to think of an example. ARLP might be it. Yeah, maybe way back in the day with ARLP. You know, when, you, when you're coming off these low level, like like back here, okay? These big picture, low level cup and handles. That's one of, yeah, I keep saying one of my favorite patterns, but that's a that's a great pattern there. Bow ties off of major, major lows. I call it the Phoenix strategy. You have a stock just bottom out forever, and then you get a bow tie to the upside and it wakes up. INTC, yeah, we looked at that one. Intel, right, INTC. Did we figure out the, uh, what was the stock we were looking at earlier? Oh, I had the wrong stock in there? What were we looking at? Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. Looks like the charts look the same though, right? Okay, so you've got this and you got this inverted cup happening here, or possibly a double bottom. But yeah, so that could that could wait a minute. Okay, I see what's wrong. Yeah. All right, I'm all messed up. All right, we're back to um we're back to live here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that was Intel we were looking at. Okay, so you could see it's trying to come off its lows, but I'm just not too excited about it just yet. Um, I wouldn't really call out a cup to get excited about. Uh, it's just so wide and loose and crazy. If it was, again, if it was down here at these old lows, I'd be more excited about it. I think I think you could find something better out there. Of course, lately I hadn't had a whole lot of stocks lately. Okay, plus I, um, you could also change the display type compared to ticker. Okay. All right, so yeah, some good stuff in trading view. Okay, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. We'll we'll give it a shot. Sorry, can't be quick enough. Intel form a good No, I don't see. I don't really see it as something to get excited about. Um, trying to think of something. Uh, the rack space might be one. I've been showing that to my clients for a couple of weeks now, on a on a grandiose scale. This is sort of what I like to see, but it, it this one's so wide and loose. That's why I didn't recommend it as an official setup. It's kind of all over the place. Oh, anytime, Brian. Thanks for participating. Yeah, I would add some more. I, I hear you're watching those Bellwethers, Intel, and AMD, but you might want to add a few more to your list. Okay, let me check for questions over here. Yeah, thanks for all your help with the getting these charts up. That, that that might help some people out. And somebody had uh, somebody on Twitter is was looking for the code for um, Landry Light, and there is some code out there for Landry Lights that one of my clients uh, provided, uh, or at least provided a link to the code. So if you follow me on Twitter, you can get that code. I'm at T Following Moron. Is Twitter. All right, any more? 
Well, obviously, we want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time and busy schedule. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, it happens. Uh, it's spell with silent age. Everybody have a great night. To those of you who are in the Facebook group, I'll see you guys and girls tomorrow. Everybody else, have a fantastic weekend. And between now and the next show, may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.